Good afternoon, I'm Matt Farrar, he's Joe Clements. We're coming to you live from our offices here at Strategic Digital Services in Tallahassee. You are getting the, uh, the first glimpse of our new podcast studio here, Joe. So uh, unfortunately, uh, the folks watching via Facebook Live are probably not going to get the, the best audio. The best audio is coming from these fancy new microphones uh, being recorded for our new podcast. But I'm pretty excited about yeah. all the new equipment we've got in here. It's gonna be interesting. We will at some point figure out how to do both a Facebook Live broadcast with good audio and the podcast with good audio. We're so close. We're really getting there. Um, all right, you ready to roll? Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about what's going on in the, uh, the marketing world this week. All right, so I think the big news here is Facebook is back in the news, never really got out. Uh, so Facebook last week announced that they had removed um, several pages for what they call inauthentic coordinated activity. Um, which is an unusual term to describe anything to me, but that's what they did. They said there was there were Russians interfering um, with a march that was going to happen in Washington, D.C. Uh, during the one-year anniversary of Charlottesville. Uh, so corresponding to that happening, uh, there's also been a new series of complaints filed um, by immigrant and civil rights groups that now they functionally don't have good clean access to Facebook ads because of the restrictions on running political content on Facebook. Uh, Matt, do you want to take a shot at kind of explaining what the political rules are now for Facebook and how broadly uh, Facebook interprets political? Sure. So, I mean, you might think that if Facebook's trying to crack down on making sure political content is appropriately disclaimed, then there would be a very clear definition of what is political content on Facebook, right? That would make sense if they're going to try to enforce that. The reality is that there is not a very clear definition of what is political content and what is not. Uh, the answer, unfortunately, is basically if Facebook decides that it's political content, if it sounds like you're talking about something that is politically motivated or policy related, they're going to disclaim it that way, even if you're just a blogger, even if you're just someone yeah. who's commenting on news and trying to run an ad. It, it's very broad, too. It covers yeah. issues, not just... So when, you know, traditionally when you think of political speech, you think of something that abdicates the defeat or election of a candidate or something uh, on the ballot. Facebook includes any policy, political issue whatsoever, and what's happened is that has... Even if you're not advancing a, a, a side of it, right? Yeah. I mean, for the most part, even if you're just talking about it. Yeah, it, and so what's gotten scooped up there is the controversy this week, or um, LGBT and immigrant and civil rights and Hispanic advocacy groups. Um, so not only are they having... You know, here's the, the quandary they're having, they're saying, for the, um, for the uh, immigrant groups is... Uh, they have people here who are undocumented. Facebook, in order to run Facebook ads, requires, um, for political purposes, requires that you submit um, address and a social security number, which obviously someone who's undocumented wouldn't have those materials, sure. uh, and so they can't run ads. Uh, in addition, it's taking, in some cases, five, six, seven days for Facebook to approve um, the posts and ads that are being run by these groups. Uh, I'm not at all surprised by this when Facebook went to this method of they had to review everything. I, I thought this would happen, and Facebook has done a pretty good job warning everybody that this would happen. Um, I don't think Facebook and the news does indicate that they're backing down on the policy at all. I think it's a new reality of the platform. Uh, it's not as fast, it's not as lean, uh, and it's not as easy to get on and, and start pushing information. And look, if you think just about foreign influence in elections or foreign influence or whatever, I guess that's good. But the fact is, 99% of the use cases for people on Facebook, it, it's not. It's people or groups just trying to spread a message that they have that they want to share. Um, and it's you know become, in the last four or five months, significantly more difficult to do so on the platform. Oh, this is, I mean, this is the unintended side effect of regulation. They tried to fix one thing, and they created a bunch of new problems, which is a which is a classic story when you try to, to regulate something that's been largely, you know, unregulated prior. Yeah, and is so large and diverse that it's not clear how you could fairly and consistently regulate all the content that's going out on it. I'll give you a good example of how this is being applied and you know, basically without teeth, right? There's people obviously being affected by it, but there's there's no teeth to it. Um, I've been getting targeted 
with a lot of ads for what are essentially unofficial Trump campaign merchandise, right? This is this is stuff that people are trying to sell using Facebook ads, but it's not the actual campaign. It's not anything to do with, um, you know, the, the Trump official political committee. It's basically people that are trying to make a buck off of some of Donald Trump's taglines, but they're still getting caught up in the political messaging, even though they're just trying to sell gear. So they're literally just coming up with either fake disclaimers or disclaimers that are just, you know, the name of the the fake page that they're selling from and pretending like they're like they're the Donald Trump campaign to sell gear. Now, the interesting thing about this is Facebook actually made those things seem more legitimate by requiring there to be a disclaimer on there. So it actually looks more official than it did before. Yeah, and and so what's interesting in that case, in order to sell that product, someone who controls that page had to submit their address and their social security number and be validated by Facebook in order to sell that product. Yep. uh, you know, so this kind of ties into another thing that's happened today, which, it, and look, I, it doesn't really matter how you th- feel about Alex Jones. I think the fact that everybody kind of jumped in at once today, Facebook and Google and Apple, on uh, taking that content down is something that if you're a marketer, and look, the, the foundation of marketing and advertising is is speech, right? It, it's, it's communication. Um, and, and look, this will probably never happen to a major corporation, but it could happen to smaller ones. Um, you know, I, I, I worry that the, you know, look, Alex Jones, it's a fringe view, it's a niche view, um, but outright suppressing it seems to me to be not the way to handle it. Right, like the way you handle information you don't agree with, um, that you think is wrong, is like you say it's wrong and you make your case about why it's wrong and, and why it's bad. Um, I, my personal thought is all banning it does is give credence to the conspiratorial viewpoint, which is that there's, uh, you know, there's an a alliance. greater power yeah. conspired against you. Yeah, yeah you yeah, spoke to, too much to truth, sure then you got taken down. Out there for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a it's a bad way of handling it. I think it sets a really bad precedent. Um, you know, because what what views are next to be taken down? And and look, you could argue that like, you know, it, it's a fringe you know right wing view, but it represents a minority viewpoint, and you don't want to be in the habit in a democracy of like taking down minority viewpoints. And here's why I'll bring this back into marketing and advertising, is there's a lot of products that are fundamentally sold to people who hold minority viewpoints. So uh, you could talk about uh, firearms, you could talk about certain types of shirts, like you're talking about, you know, Trump shirts, or you could talk about, um, you know, apparel geared towards, uh, you know, transgendered people that, uh, you know, helps obscure body types. Uh, There's a lot of stuff that would be a minority viewpoint, a, a fringe view, that like, I mean, do we really want to be in the habit of just when we decide we disagree with it, it just gets disappeared? I mean, it's an interesting question. I think one of the problems, though, is, I mean, when you you depend on, you know, a variety of other services for the distribution of your message, and look, this isn't a knock on anybody. We're talking to you on Facebook Live or on, you know, whatever podcast app you're listening to right now on your phone. So it's not that... It's not that it's a bad strategy, but when you depend on someone else for the distribution of your message, you know, that th- this is what happens sometimes. You're at their whims yeah. and they all of a sudden decide, I mean, whether it's because they disagree with your, mm-hmm. you know, political or speech content, um, or whether it's decide whether it's they decide they don't want certain types of companies advertising, like th- this is what you're at the mercy of. Yeah. Um, I look, I think, I agree with you. I think the issue is when you build your platform around the concept of, you know, connection and the free exchange of information, and then you violate that, you do a lot to undermine the credibility of your A hundred percent, yep. Um, And and look, I I do think, you know, it looks like Facebook and YouTube are unassailable, um, and and Google are are unassailable in their position, but like, you know, I I do believe they're not unassailable in that position indefinitely, and you can only carve out so many minority viewpoints until you've created a majority of, of people that will go somewhere else. Yep. Um, and look, the reason they're doing this, by the way, isn't because Facebook or Google are heavily invested in 
I mean, I'm sure they're supporters of liberal democracy in the West, but it's not that. Like, they're doing it because they want to protect advertisers on the platform. You don't want to put your ad for Tide detergent, you know, next to an Alex Jones screed that someone sees. Like, and so in a lot of ways, like, this is um, corporate and, and market driven. Uh, that's what Google and, and Facebook are actually responding to. Like, there's a lot of people on the right that would say, like, they're silencing a leftist viewpoint. They're not. They're actually responding to the advertisers who fund both of their platforms who, don't, who want to make sure they are only being placed in brand-safe environments. So what's the middle ground there? What's, what would you say the, the right way to handle that is? Because, I mean, you, you kind of see both sides, right? Like Facebook shouldn't be forced to show, you know, the content. Advertisers shouldn't be forced to have, you know, people that they vehemently disagree with, like be the content that they're advertising on. So what's the middle ground of, of making both sides feel comfortable where you're not violating, you know, any free speech, but you're also protecting your advertisers in a way that's fairly legitimate to want to be protected. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think this is actually a matter of public ignorance on how the internet works. Like, uh, I think most people think it works like TV, where if you saw that ad for Tide detergent on, like, the Alex Jones, you know, interstitial, that, like, Tide must have given Alex Jones money to run that ad. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. The ad goes through the platform, and it's targeted to the user. I think that's what drives brand paranoia about that, about you know the brand safe content, is because they, and they're probably right, they believe the consumers don't understand how those platforms work. And they're probably right. Yeah, and they're probably right. But I actually think that's the solution is people need to understand, they need to be better educated about how media works and how internet media works. Yep. Um, let's move on to the, uh, let's move on to the next story. Uh, all right, so we talked uh, two weeks ago, I think, about Facebook launching a dating app. Here's the interesting little sidebar on this. And I hear producer Kyle's very excited about it. Found that Facebook. <laughs> Sorry, got it. Um, is Facebook is going to prompt in the Facebook uh, dating feature with some example pickup lines, some conversation starters. So what I think is interesting about this is that Facebook gets really good at it, right? They will know, like, you know, say what what a certain type of a woman, what pickup lines, what initial contacts she responds to, and then they could start offering <laughs> tailored lines to this men who are interested. social hacking at its finest yeah. in 2018. <laughs> which, which leads me to the natural question. Joe, what is your best or favorite pickup line? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. Just I'm going to assume that that's that. how you got Sarah. I wouldn't remember. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. Um, so are you, I, are you saying like people that like if she responds, like if the person responds to like So I don't think Facebook lines, is doing that now. They're just suggesting ones. I mean, but that's I like very quickly thing, in yeah. the future. Once you have a, a sample data set of like, oh, here's the common phrases and words that yeah. are in like the initial approach text that this particular woman or you know, the look-alike audience of this mm -hmm. woman or man respond to, and then starts prompting you with that. Are you talking about, like, the specific person? Yeah. Okay. Well, right now, it's like, just general. The, well, it's I mean, like, you think, like, you're thinking to, like, to the end of the 100%. Yeah. 100%. That's the goal. Because, like, right now, like, I wouldn't say right now, like, um, like, on other dating apps, they have stuff like that, where it's, like... But it, it's not to the individual level. It's like, say something, like, say hello, or, like, say stuff you usually say. Yeah. Not, so like, what they would I, I think this could get to the point where if it hits enough scale, it's algorithmically targeted. Like, yeah. you know that a certain woman has responded to 75% of Facebook's conversation starters. Facebook's keys to her heart, Kyle. Yeah. Facebook, yep. Facebook algorithm. Only people that understand women. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, but that's what it will look like, right? Yeah, exactly. um, so that's what I thought was interesting there is yeah. the, uh, it is, you know, the algorithmic, uh, you know, the potential for an algorithmic pickup line yeah. uh, generator from Facebook. Yes. Um, you know, m moving on here, here's the other interesting story that I thought, and look, there's a lot of Facebook news. There's kind of always is. Uh, Facebook is now a major mobile browser in the U.S. This is out of TechCrunch with 10% plus market share in many states. So what this means is when you open a link in Facebook, it doesn't send you to Safari or to Chrome if you have an Android device. It's opening up a Facebook-owned browser 
inside of that Facebook app. Uh, and so a lot of, there's a lot of significance to controlling the browser for Facebook. Uh, you know, you can't put a cookie in it. It, um, you know, it gives Facebook a deeper insight into what a user is doing on your page. Uh, there's a lot of things implicit. And I think that 10% number is indicative. There's probably a significant number of people in the United States whose primary access point to the internet is directly through Facebook. I mean, look, week after week when we tell you that Facebook is eating the internet, this is what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, and look, what, what does this mean, like, practically, if you're a marketer? I mean, you know, so everybody right now, when they launch a website or a page, you're going to test on Chrome, you're going to test on whatever Internet Explorer is called now. What's it called now? Uh, Microsoft Edge. Yeah, Edge. sure, Edge. You're gonna, well, you're still going to test on Explorer because people have that still. <laughs> oh, i got to get that IE6. You're going you're gonna to test on Edge. You're going to test on mobile Chrome. You're going to test on desktop. There's all this testing you go through. What I would say now you need to test is you need to make sure you're opening in the Facebook browser properly. And a, a very common issue I find are, are mobile web pages that don't open properly in the Facebook browser. A lot of times it's, it's slow load times, too. I mean, yeah. the... One of the side effects of the internet um, being so accessible and you know amateur websites popping up left and right, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but one of the side effects of that has you know been now that it's super easy to create a Squarespace site or go make your own WordPress site, um, people aren't necessarily taking the the basic steps of, of web design and making some. They're not using images that are that are small in size and easy to quickly yeah. load. You know, they're dropping a five or six megabyte image as the background. Um, instead full of high res. It. Yeah, image. making a full high res photo that they paid a photographer to come take. And it's taking, you know, 10 seconds to load their website instead of one. And I think that's actually what's killing a lot of businesses or a lot of, you know, early stage businesses or, you know, independent web traffic is they're not using good web design practices. So. I mean, look, people are going to drop off on Facebook yep. if it takes more than a second or two to load your website. So if you're waiting for that full res image to download, people are going to go away. And this is important because we were on a call with um, our Facebook account executive last week. And one of the things she was stressing is make sure when you're buying Facebook ads, don't just buy click ads, buy landing page views. Because it's a very different type of thing for someone to click than it is for someone to wait for the page to load and get to the page. And Facebook has a pretty good idea of what the differences between those two people are. Yeah, well, thanks to the browser, they right. actually even know how long they spent on your page yep. once you click, mm -hmm. which gives Facebook an enormous ability to target the people who are likely to linger on your page and then convert from your page. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of powerful and interesting synergies that go on when you control that browser. Uh, Matt, I know you, did you have to head out in a few minutes? Yep, I've got okay. about five minutes. Cool. We can keep going, though. Yeah, whatever you don't miss, I'll just soliloquy through the rest of time with me right. and producer Kyle. <laughs> um, all right. You know, so we talk a lot about Facebook. And, you know, when we're doing the research for the show, um, you know, pre-show, one of the things we do is we Google, kind of check out the news for each platform. And when you search for information about Facebook, you get all kinds of, political and hard news stories. You get the updates stories. on who's pissed off at Facebook. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> when you search for Google, you get, uh, you know, Google just invented a parachute that brings internet to Mars, right? Like, it's all kinds of things like that on, on Google. Uh, but what's interesting is when you search Instagram, you don't get stories about Instagram. You get stories about how people are using Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that indicates to me if you are um, if you are working in a business where you're trying to influence culture in some form, you're trying to change culture, you're trying to, you know, uh, sell a pair of pants, a, you know, coffee mug, a, you know, vacation destination, whatever it is, is Instagram's probably the place you want to be now. It is the place where culture is being set uh, and pushed forward, uh, especially for younger consumers, uh, Gen Gen X and Millennials. Like I think for boomers it's probably still true. Facebook is 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 doing that. I think once you get down in age to below forty and eat and in popular culture in general, Instagram is the play right now. Uh, you know, i I don't think Instagram still will push as much direct conversions if you're trying to build an email list or sell a product as Facebook will. 
But if you want people to think about you, if you want brand awareness, if you want branding, Instagram is the place to be. I think it depends on how you look at tube selling selling a product. On Instagram, you're probably looking at selling something by using influencer marketing as opposed to, to Facebook where you'd actually be making a direct sale, right? So it's it's just what works better for the platform. Like, I mean, influencer marketing is taking place much more so on Instagram than it is on, yeah. than it is on Facebook. Um, and I think a lot of I think a lot of e-commerce and a lot of online sales going forward, you know, looks a lot more like influencer marketing than it does, you know, click this, you know, click this online ad to go directly to, you know, your checkout cart. Yeah, and look, here's the, you know, the thing that gets me about Instagram. Instagram is what Facebook was five or six years ago, mm -hmm. and Facebook owns it. Yep. So all the stories about Facebook, people aren't on Facebook, they're not using it. It's kind of true, but it's like wink kind of true because they all went to Instagram. And like in Instagram matters in culture. If you, are, if you are running a business right now and your Instagram presence is lacking, you got to figure that out. I think too, the, I mean, the big thing that Instagram has up on even other, you know, up and coming platforms like let's say Snapchat is like it benefits so dramatically from the fact that you can buy Instagram ads using the Facebook ads platform. Like we've talked before, you know, how much more mature and more effective the Facebook ads platform is than a lot of yeah. other networks. So, I mean, it, that is a huge boon to Instagram that they've got the ability to use the Facebook ads manager to purchase ads. I mean, you can also do, you know, a couple taps in the app to, to set up an ad, but if you're doing complex advertising, you do it through the, the Facebook ads manager, and I think that's really important. Snapchat is trying, yeah. right? Like, I mean, they're they're trying to be up and coming, but it's, they don't have, they don't have that advantage. I mean, I saw this week, one of the news items was that um, Snapchat's introducing a six second, like non-skippable inventory. So, I mean, they're trying to get there, um, but, Obviously, in addition to being popular, Instagram has the benefit of a multi-billion dollar company's ad platform backing it up right out of, you know, yeah. it, right out of the competition. And not just, that, you know, backing it up, per, in making its own user data deeper and more valuable yeah. right off the bat. And, like, I don't think we can talk about that part of it enough. Anything Facebook buys becomes instantly more valuable because the depth of the ad platform um, is beyond anything else that you can do on the internet right now. And that goes back to what we talked about on the last show is making sure you're looking at Facebook as a company and not Facebook as an app. Yeah. Um, all right. So, Matt, for your last, we have two more stories. Which one do you want to finish on? We can talk about um, Amazon's plan to monetize Alexa, or we can talk about Apple hitting $1 trillion. Uh, let's talk about Apple hitting $1 trillion. I thought dollars. you might go there. <laughs> All right, so uh, last week, Apple hit $1 trillion. I think it's actually the second company in the world to become valued at $1 trillion. I think Saudi Aramco in like 2008, briefly, for a hot second, hit the $1 trillion mark. Um, so Apple's there. It's likely to stay or linger there. Um, talk to me about your opinion on the Apple business model the strength of it and the sustainability of it right now. Yeah, so I mean, obviously I'm a huge Apple fan. You can see my computer here, my iPhone's what's running our live show broadcast for those of you watching on Facebook Live right now. But I mean, the the strength to Apple for me is also how much cash on hand it is. Not just that it's worth a you know a trillion dollars and it's a trillion dollars of market value, but that Apple keeps so much cash on hand. Um, you and I talk about this a lot. Um, you know, the economy is not going to stay great forever like it is it is going to pop a little bit at some point and, and maybe a year from now maybe five years from now i don't i don't have great economic speculation but when we have the next downturn am or amazon apple is going to be sitting on a huge amount of cash to go buy the companies that are not able to survive through that economic downturn and i mm -hmm. think more than the fact that it's worth a trillion dollars is how much of that value is literally cash sitting in bank accounts all over the world yeah. that Apple has acquired. Well, and can start bringing back to the United States because of the because tax reform. Because of the tax reform. Yeah. Uh, so in a weird way, like Donald Trump 
may be the best thing yep. that's ever happened to Apple. Um, all right, all right, here's my take on, on Apple as a business. Um, I think we are at pretty close to peak iPhone. I think it's got about as much market penetration as it's ever going to get. I think it's the best product for most people to have who have it, and I think they stick with it. I think the growth they've been getting out of the App Store is about to level off or start declining. And I think that because the next, much of these services revenue generated by Apple in the App Store comes from in-app purchases. Yep. Um, and those in-app purchases are on apps that are dri- have installs driven from advertising on you know Facebook or on Twitter. And the next time cash starts to leave the market and all these startups fueled with cash who need app installs, you know, if people put extra money and they'll spend $10 a month in Clash of Clans or whatever, when that floods out, I think it disproportionately affects the App Store. Um, so I think Apple gets hit on that. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, I talked about this, I'm, I'm big on voice. I actually don't think the HomePod saves Apple. No. I don't think the computers save Apple. But I think it's, it's a big deal that podcasts are, are an Apple well, thing, right? I mean, that, yeah. that's where they came from. That's where they started. So, like, Android doesn't do podcasts great. Do you know what product I think is actually the future of Apple? Let's hear it. AirPods. Yep. I think Apple already has the um, augmented reality. Who told you to get a pair of AirPods? It, it was you. It was you and I did. Um, and I got it when I had them right away. It is the first wearable form of augmented reality that makes sense. Those over the next few years will get smaller. Um, The phone will get smarter in how it interacts with them. They will get smarter in how they read, uh, you know, from body and gesture. It's not something that hits over, you know, sits over our eyes. Um, It, that, that is going to be... I mean, the version 2 is coming out pretty soon is what the expectation is. There's going to be uh, better noise cancellation, there's going to be more waterproofing, there's going to be mm-hmm. a smaller form factor. So That's going to be the mobile internet of the future. Yep. It's not going to be the screen of your phone. You'll still have the phone, you'll go to it less, you'll rely on, on the audio more in, in your ear, you'll leave them in almost all the time. Uh, and here's my prediction, I think uh, Amazon is going to lock down the home through, through Alexa. Yep. Uh, and I think Apple is going to own the the audio mobile world for the foreseeable future. I think that product is far enough ahead of everything else in the market that as they continue to roll things out, like they'll be able to stay enough ahead of anyone else to, to hedge it off. And I think that is the future of the company. Yep. All right, we've got about 20 seconds. Anything else you want to tack on here at the end? Um, we can come back and talk about Alexa some more next week and the services there and the opportunities to build businesses and market businesses um, on Alexa. And hopefully we have some more um, specific uh, practical news about the platforms. Yep. Uh, I think a lot of them, I think it will be a slow August. I think this is a big vacation month for a lot of people in, uh, in Silicon Valley. And not around, around here. Yeah, not around here. So I actually expect August there won't be that many big platform announcements, and so we might have a couple more shows like this where we work with what we're given. That's all right. All right, well, if you're tuning in on Facebook Live, thanks for joining us. Uh, We appreciate you watching. As always, if you've got a question, drop it in the comments below. We'll keep an eye on it after this airs. Um, If there's anything we can do to help you out to uh, answer a question for you about marketing, specifically about digital marketing, uh, just give us a shout in the comments below, and we will take care of that for you. Uh, Once again, I'm Matt Farrar. He's Joe Clements. We appreciate you joining us today. Thank you.